seriously, what in the world happened on 9-11? And the topic, by the way, is timely. Because yesterday, it was announced that Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLeaks, will walk free. If I had to put it into just one sentence, what did Julian Assange accomplish as the founder and the editor of WikiLeaks? I would say Julian Assange exposed the military-industrial complex. Now, this is according to Haaretz. I'm sure I'm not saying that right. You know, it's a very popular Israeli publication. Check out this headline from them, published September 26th, 2011. So that is 15 days after the attack. It says, Odigo workers were warned of the attacks. That is the headline. And I'm going to read you this piece of the article verbatim. It says, quote, Odigo, the instant messaging service, says that two of its workers received messages two hours before the Twin Towers attack on September 11th, predicting that the attack would happen. And the company has been cooperating with Israeli and American law enforcement, including the FBI, in trying to find the original sender of the message predicting the attack, end quote. Investigators for 9-11 families examine video taken by a man with ties to Saudi intelligence referencing a plan. Why would the mainstream media, the U.S. empire's bullhorn, go after Saudi Arabia right now like this? Well, again, as I brought to you last week, it's the petrodollar. This is basically the U.S. is taking the gloves off because they are now furious at Saudi Arabia for not renewing the petrodollar deal. All right. Good reporting from Lee Camp. Uh, yeah, that petrodollar story came out over a week ago, um, and it's still sifting out. I'm not sure when the date of the agreement was. But again, if you go back 100 years to the 1920s as opposed to the 2020s, that's when this character got involved. Now, when I interviewed, not interviewed, when I researched, oh, wrong button. I've been out of practice. Oh, wrong button again. How about that one? There we go. We'll go to the brain in a second. Uh, Philby, Sinjin Philby was an MI6 agent. Now they claim, official claim, when this cat, now his son is Kim Philby, the communist spy of the Cambridge Five who worked with Victor Rothschild 40, uh, 30 years later after this. So this is in the 1920s. Sinjin or St. John Philby is working for MI6. And when he goes and embeds himself with the Arabs, who later became Saudi Arabs, he gets with Ibn Saud and he takes on a native wife. He practices Islam. He is fully like integrated into their society. Very powerful, influential. He's like a Colonel House character. If Ibn Saud is Woodrow Wilson, this is like the, the Colonel House. Um, interesting that MI6 the official claim is that they stopped paying Philby in 1923 and he was doing this stuff in 1925. But if you look, you can find they have Philby's pay stubs. He's still getting paid by MI6 in 1925. So it's fascinating. I do have another book on that that's in reach. Uh, Georgian. So King George, I don't know. Why do they call him the Georgians? Yeah, King George V. Uh, Sinjin Philby is in here along with Nancy Astor of the Cliveden set. That's the... Anglo-American establishment opposite of the Georgetown set. So when Quigley's talking about the Georgetown set, the, gr the group of people in Georgetown that led to Kennedy's assassination, for instance, the Cliveden set is the group in London that supported the Nazis. So these are like the, uh, you know, th th there's the people who like support Hitler in this book too. So Sinjin Philby should be on your radar. Let's go over here to the history blueprint. I wanted to take you to Clark Clifford and BCCI, but I, I got to take you to Phil B first. So let's go Phil B. Now, again, if you're interested in the history blueprint, you have access as a member of grandtheftworld.com. Here's the father. He's called Sinjin Hillary, Harry, St. John, Bridger, Phil B. He's a CIE. Just call him Jack Philby. All right. Ibn Saud is who he brings to power. And this also connects to those 28 pages of the 9-11 Commission report. So if you follow it all the way up through another 80 years and the Saudis being involved with 9-11, it's hard to disambiguate the Saudis from the British intelligence and the Zionist intelligence infrastructure that kind of brought it to power. It's very interesting. you got a bunch of uh, long-time characters of British intelligence and Anglo-American intelligence 
that are uh, circling around Philby. And when you trace his activities, there's a long line, like, like the, the Mujahideen and all these other freedom fighters, proxy armies used like the Muslim Brotherhood used by MI6 to uh, to put a glove on their hand of empire as they take actions throughout the world. I mean, what did uh, Assange call it? He called it the transnational security elite. That was his phrasing. That's the deep state. It's a transnational security elite. They they own the defense companies, right? Like, let's just rewind. Let's rewind for you for a second. Let's go to 1947. And we're not going to go to BCCI. We'll go to the guy who participated in this cartel. And his name was Clark Clifford. And in 1947, they created something called the National Security Act. He's a lawyer. He's a Wall Street lawyer. And he's named in the book, uh, The Wise Men by Walter Isaacson. He was also Secretary of Defense. He has a Presidential Medal of Freedom. He creates the National Security Act, but then is involved with Anglo-American drug money laundering, arms dealing type of stuff, which is what they use national security for. Now it makes the Afghanistan war, the Iraq war, all these other type of wars like this is gangster stuff. And they use national security. Now, in 1947, they also reorganized all of America's security. So it went from the Department of War the Department of Defense. And they created shortly after this National Security Act, they created CIA. What did we learn about CIA earlier this episode? They're involved in skullduggery domestically. See, that's the problem. When you when you create these types of fighting dogs, sometimes they attack the owners, right? Or if MI6 created CIA as its installation in America, which it did, then all the other things kind of make a lot more sense, right? When it's not approved of by the Empire whether it's JFK or Assange or Ross, uh, these types of things don't go very well because the population tolerates it and lets good people take the rap for everyone else's freedom. All right, so National Security Act. Now let's go back for a second to BCCI. That is the Bank of Credit and Commerce International. It is the major drawing of an artist called Mark Lombardi who allegedly died as died of his own hand as they say suicide march 11th three or march 22nd 2000 so like 322 the skull and bones date he's tracking skull and bones money laundering and deep state activity i don't think it's accidental part of what you learn from studying lombardi's work is that you got the bcci is like this whole entanglement you've got khashoggi's in here didn't we just hear about jamal khashoggi that got chopped up Right in that last clip, Adnan's involved in BCCI with Trump and Iran Contra. There's there's a whole bunch of stuff right here. Like, so the the fabric of today's news is so interesting because it's not a textile just being woven out of whole cloth. It's a continuation of what they've been doing over the past hundred plus years. Okay, now uh, way back in the day when I blew the whistle, there was no WikiLeaks. And I went to the reputable journalists, the reputable people in our society that I thought might have some upward mobility to get the message out. But essentially, when you're trying to take a story that says, hey, the people you think are in control are the criminals doing it, they kind of feel helpless too. And when I said that every billionaire circ like encircles himself with a moat of gurus and experts and you got to get through them, that's not always true. Because we had to sit down for a whole afternoon with Jamie Johnson, who's the heir to the Johnson & Johnson fortune. He's a billionaire. I didn't have to go through anybody to have a sit down with him. Told him basically the same stuff I told Cuban's assistant. And what you see is they're not in on it. Well, at least Jamie, Jamie Johnson was not on it. He was like 24 years old. And what I told him was, bro, you're a billionaire and you're not in the game. This is going on. Here's the evidence. And you're just as helpless yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was a good reckoning, I guess, uh, a good uh, realization to see, like, even if you had a billion dollars, those people still feel that they can't do anything about it either. So, strength in numbers is what we need, and what we need is common sense. We need, like, loose change that was mentioned in that block. That was the 21st century equivalent to Thomas Paine's common sense. It made USA Today. I remember my mom sending me. She's like, hey, uh, that movie that you talked about and, you know, you know, the guys that made it like 
that's in USA Today. It's like that type of news was permeating society for a while. And then they created a big civil war in the 9-11 truth movement. They got everyone to divide and conquer. They re-educated some people. Like maybe, uh, I don't want to dox anybody with that either. But there were people taken off the scene and re-educated and then put back out. One of their last names might be Veach. But uh, you'd have to put the other part together. All right, so WikiLeaks comes around. I thought it was a honeypot. I'm like, surely this thing that is publishing all this secret stuff and not getting prosecuted is a government honeypot to catch whistleblowers, right? They had this whole thing where you could supply and encrypt it and get Chelsea Manning out of it. I don't know. So where are we at today? We have the internet a little bit still. It's not as fun as it was 20 years ago. But if you look at the 90s, like unless you went to the establishment media, there was no way for a whistleblower to get information to the public. They made movies on it in the 70s. Um, Three Days of the Condor with Robert Redford, where he's like, I'm going to blow the whistle. And the guy's like, what happens when they don't print it? Meaning the CIA owned the New York Times. And they were telling the public that back then. So in this situation, I think it's more important now than ever that people develop themselves as the strong individuals and strong leaders that you wish were actually ruling things. Because as you come to see as an adult, the people running stuff aren't the best among us. They're not the smartest among us. They're not the most ethical, and they definitely don't have the most integrity. They're there because we find other things to do with our time, and we make excuses why it's okay to let tyrants and despots run roughshod over us. But I think that is a phase, and I think that we as Americans and human beings around the world, we can outgrow that phase. We can make it so that we're bigger, and we can't put that on anymore. I'm sorry. But that harness, that bridle, that saddle doesn't fit anymore. And uh, then I think freedom and liberty reemerges in a more serious, long-term, permanent way where the slavery becomes obsolete. It can no longer be tolerated. It can no longer be serviced and maintained. But maybe that's just me. Now, also in that clip, we had Israel... Featured, uh, Candace just discovered that it's like 20 some years ago. Let me look up a little company, Amdocs. Oh, here they are. They're over here in the history blueprint. That's where I keep them. These people and Converse technology. Now, you might say, how? <clears throat> I mean, because Odigo was the story, and is that uh, I, I probably do have Odigo in here someplace if we look for it. But Odigo was a Israeli private messaging platform that was used to warn other Israelis about the pending attack on a very specific location at a very specific time. And you might say, how did the hijackers do that? And I would say hijackers can't do that. But the Six Eyes intelligence network that I've been telling you about and teaching you about, they're the ones who have the power. They're the actual only ones on the planet who have the power to do the thing in the way that it was done. So when trying to like track down the who done it, when someone's like, we have the authority to actually do something about this, then I'll disclose things further. But until then, I'm going to speak as uh, peripherally as I can, because the people who did the thing that blew up many of my former coworkers, they're still in power. And as far as I've seen, nobody who has any type of wealth has the cojones to do a fucking thing about it. There's a lot of creative things you could do about it. You could be running ad campaigns, billboards, all these sort of things. There are ways to erode the illusion of the official narrative, but continuing to tolerate it and buy like, oh, here's some new evidence from 20 years ago that they're just now showing us. The people showing it to you are the people who lied and did the thing and kept the truth secret in the first place under national security. I just want to make sure that's clear in case people don't know what Amdocs and Converse and these sort of things, like th these are, these are, they had all your data. They knew everybody's everything. They had all the intel they wanted. This is not the work of an ally. This is the work of espionage. This is the work of what actually they prosecuted and got Assange to sign guilty for. These groups of people in the Anglo American Israeli establishment, they do it full time without any prosecution. And I think the people who did these things should probably go to Belmarsh for five years or more. That's yeah, just man. my opinion.
Absolutely. And that was really interesting because that was the first time I heard of that Odigo rabbit hole. Right? I never heard of that before. So, uh, so it said like they, so two employees received text messages, but they're, and then when they were in the video, they were talking about how like only four Israeli citizens perished that day. Like, are they implying that like, well, they're dual citizens. First dual, off, dual citizens. Okay. one of them is, um, what was his name? Herb Cantor. Let's see. In uh, America, Tribute to Heroes, the concert they had suspiciously right after 9-11, very beautifully arranged. U2 played, Pearl Jam played, Sting played. Sting said, I would like to commemorate my friend, what do you say, Herbert Stanford? What was the guy's name? Anyway, someone will find it in the chat, uh, hopefully. And so he, Sting talks about someone who died, right? In the trade centers. And I'm pretty sure he's at Cantor Fitzgerald. Cantor Fitzgerald had certain contracts with the United States government about federal treasury bonds and stuff like this, that in their absence on 9-11, because their their operations get destroyed. They're, they're right above Marsha McLennan, where I worked, in North Tower. Cantor Fitzgerald goes offline. All those contracts default over J.P. Morgan Chase, which is like the American version of the biggest gangster bank in history. See? Yeah. They're texting me now. They're like, don't talk about us. I won't talk about it. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. So very interesting. In the milieu of like the people telling you about 9-11 and the evidence and stuff, it's like they're the legacy of the people who did it. Just like the people who did 9-11 were the legacy of people who did not uh did JFK's assassination, which is again, an it's an international operation along with organized crime as a front. The front, you know, they just always have to have a glove on their hand. Otherwise, you recognize it's them. So in America, they'll use the mafia. Overseas, they use Arab proxies. ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Mujahideen, Muslim Brotherhood. I don't know who they use. What's their Israeli proxy army? I'm just asking for a friend. I don't think, don't think they have one. <laughs> I was mostly shocked in all that to learn that Iraq and Afghanistan didn't really have anything to do with 9-11. Like it seems to be the only ones they didn't mention at all. Yeah, I mean, I can excuse Candace. <laughs> she got a couple of things in, inaccurate. It was, she said 2021, but it was it was November of 2001 when the Odigo story had, had broken. So uh, that yeah. was one. And then the other part was, and again, she was in grade school or whatever. But 20 days after 9/11, they were in Afghanistan. They were in Afghanistan with desert equipment. How'd you know you're going to the desert? What's the logistics on getting new uniforms for everybody? Right? Just asking for a friend. What does it mean that on September 4th, you guys already approved the war plan for Afghanistan? What's that mean? I'll take a sip while you consider it. Mm. I don't know. Yeah. Like, who, who, <laughs> what empire has like uh, a history of colonizing Afghanistan for the opium? British Empire. In fact, let's go to the history blueprint. I'll just type in. Anglo Af Anglo Afghan. Oh, that's the wrong button. That's show card. Anglo Afghan wars. If I could type. There's the first. Now we should open up the Wikipedia on this, and we'll read it in a second. Well, actually, we'll read it now. The first Anglo Afghan war, British Empire against the emirate of kabul from 1838 so they start in 1838 okay and then let's go back to the blueprint let's go to the second anglo-afghan war because after they did there's the third here's the second one and let's go to the wiki we'll press this button 1878 to 1880 they're still at it okay when's the third anglo-afghan war let's go back to the brain we'll click third anglo-afghan war we're gonna click the wikipedia because we want to learn about it i'm just showing you guys how to use what you have access to third anglo-afghan war so 1919 until when then they had a treaty all right so basically what happens in 1919 world war one ends they install the council on foreign relations in america soon thereafter and then within the next century we're back at it after they've already set up this infrastructure now, in between times, 1975, there's a movie with Sean Connery, and uh, it's called The Man Who Would Be King. Michael Caine is in it. And Sean Connery and Michael Caine are Freemasons, British Freemasons, because 
they used Freemasonry to expand the empire. So they would set up a trading post and then a Masonic lodge, and then it became a fortified trading post, which is a fort. That's a military presence. And the military was recruited using Freemasonry. And it was like an international language, but really just a British empire international language. So uh, in the movie, uh, it's a Kipling story brought to life in the seventies. So Kipling was Rhodes's best friend and he was the agent. He was an agent of empire. Uh, it shows how they pay off warlords. They take over a country and they become king of the world. And they're replicating Alexander the Great's journey to that area and the treasure that he left and all that good stuff. So it's a good story. It's an interesting movie, but moreover, it's a reflection of the continued uh, Anglo incursions into indigenous areas using not honesty, truth, and facts to take it over, right? There's not consideration of the people's be the people being human or them having rights. It is just, no one has, uh, no King has taken it over. So it's ours, right? So in that context, it's not that much different than what they do today or what they did in Palestine in 1917, right before they got out of Afghanistan and came back to work on getting America into the empire full time for a century. So, yeah, fascinating. fascinating you can't stuff, understand man. what's going on by watching the news. That's my point. No, man. Like they'll never let you know. And it's they like, call this the great game for a reason. Like it's still going on. It's just a new great game, you know? And we're not taught this in school. So, how would it ever be on anyone's radar if we didn't have shows like this and uh, take the time to elucidate? Oh, look, there's Cecil Rhodes. Look, he's, he's the sign from new, new imperialism. That might still be going on. I don't know. You teach people to read, but will they read? Oh, look, here's Rutgerd Kipling. And it's Kim. So anyway, it's a long story. Maybe you should start looking into it. Twice a year, I teach a course called Autonomy. It's a 12-week course. It teaches leadership, entrepreneur skills, executive skills. All these types of things that I saw were taken out of our education system in order to make the schooling or indoctrination system that we've all probably went through. And it has served us well enough to be interchangeable cogs in the machine of the globalists. But if we want a homestead, if we want uh, a write our own ticket, work from home job, work from anywhere type of situation, they're not exactly handing those out at the end of college. They give you a piece of paper and they're like, good luck. So reality is dropping us off here, but the demands of reality are up here. So I created autonomy to help people close that gap for themselves so they can level up their skills to the demands of the situations that life is putting in front of us presently. Life's demands of intellect and understanding precision and complexity are ever increasing. The schooling didn't prepare us for it. The media is not going to do anything but reinforce what schooling prepared us for. And so we're going to have to take a leadership position and take steps off the beaten path to kind of blaze our own trail in life. What makes the Grand Theft World podcast unique, invigorating, exciting, and informative? Most other podcasts out there are either doing straight up interviews or they're just covering the daily news. They're covering current events from the day they happen. And that is effective. It's useful. It's a great starting point. And then sometimes these current events change during the week past the first story. So we like to give it a little time. You have to wait till some of the dust settles on these stories in order to give them accurate coverage. And the other thing that's really missing in the media landscape is covering the articles that are coming out every day. That's great. That's necessary. But who's bringing in contextual history so that you can understand what has been going on for decades and decades to lead up to the machinations and actions that we see unfolding today. So what we do here on the podcast is we cover current events. Many of these things are censored, but we wait about a week. As a forensic historian, I focused mainly through my career on the history of globalism and collectivism and things that they call maybe the new world order. There's a lot of facts to these sort of circumstances, groups, events, activities, working groups that they've had over time. So for Grand Theft World listeners, we not only break down the current events, most of which that are censored during the week, we provide you with contextual history, we give you the source notes, the references, we do deep dives, and this really empowers you 
with an understanding of context and history so that you can make more informed decisions in your life. There's also a community, a membership where you guys can actually ask questions and we can get into the show and share evidence. And there's a town hall weekly for Grand Theft World for those who listen to it and are interested in covering the stories that we don't get to during a six hour show. Listening to it an hour a day, you could uh, easily consume the week's news, but you're gonna have substance and meaning and context and understanding. And with that, you can make higher quality decisions in your life. So if you're interested, in more quality in your life, go to grandtheftworld.com, click podcast at the top, and we'll see you there. Thank you. These allegations are false. This isn't Grand Theft Auto, folks. This isn't a video game. What are the most surprising things that you discovered once you started pulling on that thread, who he was connected to, what institutions he was influential over, what events he participated in? Come on, man. What are you talking about? Come on, man. Oh. You don't have to think about it, dude. I got this quote because uh, you said you didn't know much about Klaus Schwab. I made it my job to, as soon as this happened, I'm like, okay, this guy's their front man. Let me learn about the official history of the World Economic Forum. I got their 40 year history. I got every book that Klaus Schwab has written or ghost written. I went through those books. This is one of the most interesting passages. Come on, man. Come on.